welcome. I'm, I'm so glad to see you all here and not uh, still uh, at one of those one, uh, breakfasts or whatever. Uh, this morning's session is focusing on, instead of how we supply energy, how we use it. And um, the big picture that I hope you all walk away is the way we've transformed the energy system in the United States has been dominantly through the demand side of the energy market because that is where the most fundamental changes have happened. And go back to the oil crisis that, that was in 1973 and before that. Before that, nobody cared about energy. Yeah, some people did. They produced it. But in the use of energy, there was almost no public policy attention associated with that. And then there was the air oil embargo, a shot across the bow. And everything changed in industry and in, in, in government, uh, individual households paying attention to energy. As a result, if we look at um, this graph, Look at before 1973, we had the growth of energy use. If we followed that trend, it was, go it was growing with GDP only about a half a percent less. If we followed the trend, we would have followed that, that red line. The actual is we, there was this inflection point, and the actual use of energy followed the blue line. So we were very concerned about national security, as well we should have been, with a large amount of energy imports. So if you use less energy, you import less energy. So you can look, that's the amount by which we've reduced imports through more energy efficiency relative to the pre-73 trends. We've also increased uh, domestic production and increasing domestic production of energy also reduces imports. That's the amount we've, we've reduced imports by domestic energy. And so you see the red, we're down to a place where we're almost, as the United States, uh, zero net importers and, and in the world, and, and we will become net exporters. But most of those imports are from our friendly neighbor for the north, Canada. So we're now secure in ways that we weren't, mostly because of energy efficiency and a little bit because of what's happened on the supply side. Notice the purple's nuclear. Half of that was nuclear power. Then carbon dioxide. We have uh, uh, reduced carbon dioxide intensity. I use what's so the Kaya identity, which I've written the math down there. You don't have to pay attention to it. But um, we, if you see that red line, we've decarbonized the economy by 64% since 1973. That means there's only 36% as much energy per dollar of GDP. That amount is because of the energy intensity trends of our economy before 73. That's the result of the enhanced energy efficiency uh, since 1973. And that black line is the results of everything about clean energy, wind and solar and geothermal and nuclear power and fracking for natural gas, pushing out coal is the width of that black line in cleaning up the system. So, uh, and half of that's nuclear power. So again, energy efficiency is how we've decarbonized the economy. And finally, uh, a graph as I end up um, looking at a decade by decade, before the energy crisis, 1973, see the purple is, is the rate of growth of the gross domestic product. The, the blue and the red was the, the uh, changing energy intensity of the economy and decarbonizing of the energy system. The green adds those two together because those are small 
carbon dioxide emissions grew roughly with the economy, a little bit less. Once we had the energy crisis, if you look at, oh, this is too wimpy, um, the blue energy efficiency on a decade-by-decade -decade basis is in the order of 2% a year reduction. Um, carbon intensity of energy consumption is very small, except for the last five years, and now we're cleaning up the energy system. A lot of vast natural gas pushing out coal. And so it's, it's the cleaning up of the energy system is caught up to half as fast as the rate at which we're decarbonizing through energy, energy efficiency. The black is we're reducing carbon dioxide emissions because we now have that combination of cleaning up the system, more energy efficiency, and you see the purple, and because our economy is growing only slowly. So that's the big picture. What this session's about, that's the context, this session is about is how does that happen? And we're taking three individuals, uh, the theme being make it happen. Well, I want to start with Rob Bernard, who is the chief environmental strategist at Microsoft, who will talk about how does it happen from the perspective of his company. Thank you very much. Can you put the... Thank you. Um, and thank you so much for inviting us to speak today. I, I want to start with a little bit of context about, you know, why is Microsoft at an event like this? I've gotten that question in a couple of vans and a couple of side conversations, so I thought it would be interesting to maybe start with why we care about efficiency. In my team, I head up our environmental strategies. We've got quite a few people around the company working on sustainability strategy, and we think a bit from a, almost like a mission perspective of how do we empower every organization and every person on the planet to thrive in a resource-constrained world. So today we're talking about energy, but we could be talking about water, we could be talking about carbon, we could be talking about food. I think you'll see that the same patterns apply. And what we're seeing is, and a few people mentioned it yesterday, sort of post-industrial revolution or you know, different terms, we, we look at it as the fourth industrial revolution, which is everything is being disrupted around us pretty much all the time. And most of that's on the back of data. And so when we think about the energy paradigm of the future, it's going to be about how do you have an energy ecosystem built on the back of and leveraging the input of data. So I'm going to give one example today of how we're using our own corporate assets as a way to test that. But I also want to put it into the bigger context of just how does Microsoft operate and how do we think. So this is one of literally dozens of data centers around the world that we have. Uh, these data centers will be 50, 100 megawatt, even larger draws. And to give you some perspective, Microsoft as an operating company uses as much power as a small state today. Could be Vermont, not quite as much certainly as Colorado, but we use about the same amount of energy as many of the states in the United States. And when we play that forward over a decade, when you look at the growth rates of cloud computing, it's not unfathomable that a company like Microsoft will use as much energy as a small nation. So when we think about our role in the global economy, from an energy consumption standpoint and a supply chain standpoint, we think that we have the same obligation as, frankly, a state might or even a small country might under the way the world is moving. So we think about how do we actually power these massive data centers? And if you think again about our supply chain, we have a bunch of servers sitting in a bunch of buildings. Electrons are our supply chain, right? Software, electrons, machines. Um, so we said a couple years ago, hey, we have to improve the energy efficiency and energy mix that we use on the grid. And so we made a bunch of energy commitments. And again, I'll just go through this quickly to set some context. We've made a commitment to improve our overall energy mix. We're currently at about 44% combination of, let's call them low carbon or zero carbon energy, hydro, wind, solar. And we said we're going to get that to 50% by the end of next year and 60% early in the next decade. We are a carbon neutral company. So when we think about energy and energy efficiency, the most efficient electron we use is the one that we actually never use. And so we think about how do we actually get to carbon neutrality across our entire company, and I'll come back to that in just a second. How do we actually retire all the green attributes of all the investments we do in energy? Again, clean energy, conservation, and also all the carbon-based energy we have around the world. We retire all the green attributes, and then we offset the rest. And we're investing all the time in new energy technologies, and that's what I'm going to talk about today from an operational standpoint. 
So the company's carbon neutral. We'll get questions on this. I'm just going to go through it really quickly. We look at our first pillar is be lean. So that means a reduction in the amount of energy we use. And of course, we're going to use data to get there. We're going to be green by investing in more energy and certainly be accountable. So this is basically Microsoft's core headquarters operations. We have, to give you scale and sense, uh, at the time, about four years ago, five years ago, we said, what if we took data and applied data to energy efficiency? So we took a step back and we said, well, what do we already have? We had 145 buildings, 15 million square feet, 60,000 people, about 50 megawatt load. And just to give you a sense that we were spending about $60 million a year on energy. So we said, we're like a small city. The other thing is we had six different building management systems, and we were spitting out 500 million data points per day, half a billion data points a day. Now, Arun came up yesterday, talked about the work of sort of bits and watts. I suspect that in our future reality, this number, which may seem like a lot today, of 500 million data points a day from 125 buildings, will actually be small. Right? We'll be talking about hundreds of billions of data points I would imagine in most utility infrastructure systems per day around the world. So with that sort of roadmap ahead of us, how do we get from here to there and how do we leverage the data efficiently? Now, my first career before I came to Microsoft was actually in building and building management and building construction. And so if I went to 99% of the people that I used to work with and said, I'm gonna give you 500 million data points a day to run your business, I don't think that would work so well, right? And so the key, the key issue when we think about this from Microsoft's perspective is how do you democratize, commoditize, and simplify the information, right? So saying 500 million data points is actually not what you want to say. And this is a little bit small, but if you came to work in the morning and you didn't know how many data points were on your system and you had these six building management systems in the background, you actually need to abstract all that out. And so if you come to work in the morning, and I give this screen to pretty much those 99% of people who don't necessarily want to deal with 500 million data points a day, and I say, what are you going to click on? You're going to click on red, right? And all red is, is a system with a bunch of algorithms in the back that runs data processing and machine learning over all of those 500 million data points a day and says, these are our most acute problems. From an energy standpoint, although it could be security, it could be fire risk, it could be all sorts of different things, and it's all different kinds of alarms. And so we separate them into different areas. And then we can go ahead and say, I can now start to drill down on the data. And what's happened as a result of this is it throws us errors and it says, here's how much it will cost if you don't fix that problem. Here's how much energy it will cost you. Here's how much you will save the company by fixing these things. And this is really interesting. And it's been unbelievably effective for us. So just to give you some more context, Washington State's about the third cheapest energy market in the United States. It also has some of the most temperate weather in the United States. And we did this ahead of the curve before there was great commercial software available to do this. We invested, again, ahead of the curve. It took us less than 18 months to recoup our investment. Okay? Our $60 million energy bill, despite the fact that our staff and our buildings and our square footage has grown, has come down by over 10% and we're well on our way to 20% savings in energy use across our corporate campus by just leveraging the data. And I'll give you one more anecdotal story. We uh, had a building in California uh, where the energy prices are definitely higher than in Washington State, and it was a lead gold building, fully renovated, and we turned it on, and we thought we would get some value, a little bit of value out of the software, because it's a lead gold building and it should be running super efficiently. In the first month, in one building, we found $240,000 of energy savings. Turns out the sequencing of the boilers, the chillers, some of the load factors, some of the human interaction with the building which we didn't anticipate, all the flows were slightly different than we thought. So these are the things that technology, and by the way, we would never have found that if we didn't have the software system. And so I think, we're well on our way, and just to give you context, Microsoft's business model is we're not going to build a building energy management software system and sell it to different organizations, maybe your organization. We actually want to create an ecosystem of hundreds of companies around the world who are accelerating the use of machine learning, artificial intelligence, cloud computing, and sensors. Sensors are super, super cheap. Again, we did this project four or five years ago, and we still paid ourselves back in less than 18 months. There is tons of inefficiency on the magnitude order of 20% in pretty much any process or building 
manufacturing anywhere in the world. So when we want to think about how do we actually get to energy efficiency at scale, this is the way to do it. And I'll just leave you with one last thing to think about, which is even this dashboard that I showed, I think this is sort of phase one, right? So how many people here are under 35? I'm not, but that's great. Okay, so how many of you prefer to use text versus email or visual stuff versus actually going into a, a dashboard or something like this? Right? I think the next wave is, this is, I'll just call it, this is more my generation. I'm certainly well over 35. Okay? These buildings will be able to talk to you with the technology we have. I'd much rather, if I'm thinking about how I run around and manage a building, I'd much rather have my phone literally text me and say, hey, Rob, I'm in building, we number our buildings, I'm in building 125, I see you're in building 124. I'm having a problem with my output and I'm making 25 people uncomfortable right now. Right? When we think about the role of technology, we have to get even beyond this paradigm to an actual personalized interaction with the people who can make the changes that will actually drive transformation. So I'm excited that so many people under 35 are raising your hands because you're the people who are going to write the next generation of apps, which make this, which we currently think is suit, like futuristic, look old fashioned. So I'm excited. I think 20% of energy savings is just a start. And I look forward to working with people like you or anyone here in the audience to get us to 30, 40% savings. Thank you. Thank you. We have a second uh, speaker whose title has just changed recently as of uh, January 20th. He's now as a former Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Admiral Dennis McGinn. I uh, described myself yesterday in one of the smaller groups as a recovering sailor. <laughs> a week ago yesterday, I was loading boxes from my uh, office in the Pentagon into my car, a Prius, and, uh, <laughs> and have had about a week to uh, decide what a recovering sailor is really doing. And I find myself here at uh, Beaver Creek, and I said, you know, I like this recovery path. It's really, really <laughs> terrific. I want to talk to you briefly about what the Department of the Navy, the Navy and the Marine Corps, the two services in the department, and by extension, what our counterparts in Army and Air Force are doing related to energy efficiency. I start by the premise that this nation's energy security, economic security, and environmental security are all inextricably linked. You really can't do anything big in any one of those without having tremendous effects in the other. So you have to take a holistic, balanced view to how we approach national security, which rests on all of those key other securities. So for the Department of the Navy and indeed the Department of Defense, we said energy is really, really key to our ability to carry out our mission of defending the nation. And we do this in a lot of different ways. In the case of the Navy and the Marine Corps, it was a combination of energy efficiency, and the way we described it was more fight, less fuel. And also, diversifying our portfolio of energy sources uh, beyond what we had been uh, developing over the past uh, century effectively. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. This is a picture of the USS Macon Island. It's a large deck amphibious. It carries uh, marine expeditionary troops uh, around the world to do everything from humanitarian assistance to disaster relief to full-scale regional war. It has a hybrid electric drive so that when it's not going from one place to the other at a rapid speed, it can slow down, turn off the gas turbine engines, rely on the, on the diesel electric uh, power plant and save an enormous amount of fuel. Because when you're in amphibious operations, you tend to be in an area of operations for a long, long time, and you don't need to have a, an inherently inefficient, slow speed power plant. Macon Island saved unbelievable amounts of, uh, of fuel in its first deployment on the order of 40% uh, of what it would have been had it had not been a hybrid electric drive. The amphibious guys used to go crazy when as assistant secretary I would refer to them as the Prius of the seas, but you know, hey, they gotta get over it. 
This is a picture of the back end, the stern of a destroyer, and you can see under the water uh, what we call a stern flap. It saves anywhere from one and a half to two percent of fuel in, in its transit just by getting the plane of the ship, the entire ship, uh, at the right level. In addition, we're putting bulbous bows on ships under the water. We are putting uh, anti-fouling material on all of our running gear, and it saves a tremendous amount of, uh, of fuel. Little bit here, little bit there, multiplied by uh, huge uh, numbers of ships, and it really makes a big difference. More fight, less fuel. This is a picture of a petty officer in the main engineering control plant on a destroyer who is monitoring all of the rotating machinery, the pumps, the valves, the air circulating systems to determine what the optimum plant configuration should be. And this is reflective of not only the technology that we've uh, invested in throughout our Navy and Marine Corps, but the key thing of culture. The fact that every sailor, every Marine, from seaman to admiral, from lance corporal to general, needs to understand that our mission success is inextricably linked to energy and how we use energy is going to make a big difference in how the outcome of that mission goes. This is a uh, machinist mate who is uh, checking the quality, the, is it clear and bright of the fuel that's just been delivered from an oiler at sea. This in fact is a mix of biofuel with tr traditional uh, marine diesel. It's a 10% biofuel, 90% marine diesel. The idea being that at a strategic level, let's start diversifying from total 100% reliance on petroleum, and not, not that petroleum has been anything but wonderful for the uh, nation and the Navy, but let's just see what we can do in terms of uh, reducing uh, our reliance on one source of fuel and doing that not just in the United States but around the world. So that is just starting. We partner with uh, civil aviation and other nations. I was out in Hawaii last summer for the Rim of the Pacific exercise. We had uh, nine ships, including the United States ships, that used this blend of biofuel. Four others took quantities of 10,000 gallons back to their home ports to do the testing. The point being, this is the moral equivalent of strict petroleum-based products in that it's drop-in. You drop it into the tank, you don't have to change any lines, pumps, igniters, or anything like that, and we just have a different uh, range of feedstocks that produce it. This is a picture of a uh, marine howitzer, and uh, the control system to regulate exactly where you're pointing this is uh, produced by those, uh, those solar panels. So I really, really killed a couple of people when I said, so this is a solar powitzer. <laughs> Sorry. Here is a Marine that is out in the field. That, that's a flexible solar array set that allows him to recharge all kinds of different batteries. The Marines and soldiers of today rely so much on electronics, whether it's GPS or communications, night vision, aiming systems. So the ability to go away from, uh, from uh, one-time use batteries and be able to recharge in the field on patrol, tremendous savings, and oh, by the way, a tremendous advantage in their combat effectiveness. This is a command center in uh, a forward operating base in which uh, we, have, we have incorporated every aspect of uh, HVAC uh, energy efficiency, the, uh, the tent itself, the envelope, building envelope, if you will, is highly efficient to keep it warm in the winter and cold in the, uh, or cool in the, uh, in the summer. And once again, uh, we do it for the, uh, all the information technology, the computers, the command and control systems that uh, are used for this forward operating base. And the, the Marine Corps and the Army have really, really made great advances here. Oh, by the way, the reason that is so critically important is the most, most lethal mission for our Marines, our Marines and uh, our soldiers in Iraq and in Afghanistan was escorting fuel convoys. Every 50 convoys, there was a casualty. Not a good way. So by 
reducing the demand at the pointy end up on the forward operating bases, you tremendously cut back in the, with a great positive compounding effect on how much you have to put into the system and how many convoys you have to rely on. You manage what you measure. And for our shore installations, as well as for our ships at sea and our, our forward deployed Marines, automatic metering, using the power of information technology that Rob described, and making it able to be usable and to be able to make decisions on what your energy usage is, both on the load side and also where's your best value, least cost for power, uh, power supply on the generator side. This is a shot of uh, a couple of uh, folks out in California that uh, are uh, celebrating the arrival of a couple of uh, electric, uh, hybrid electric uh, automobiles. We just recently concluded a lease option with partnership with the state of California for over 400 electric vehicles, sedan types, and we're looking to expand the use of electrification for transportation to medium and heavy drive, everything from forklifts to gantry cranes, and we're also uh, working with the com commercial sector in partnership to try to figure out how to best do that. This is a uh, solar panel, and I, this is at the Marine Corps Air Station in uh, Miramar in, in Southern California, San Diego area, and they are in the microgrid business where they have some on-site generation of uh, methane gas from landfill, solar panels, and a black start control system that allows them to go off the grid in the event of a widespread grid outage and have critical loads serviced by the, these distributed energy uh, resources. And I'm not sure what that is. Rob, can you describe what that is? Some sort of data infrastructure, Some sort of data infrastructure Rob <laughs> says. So uh, <laughs> it's... That will quickly be outdated. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> These are uh, our sailors in uh, one of our, uh, on top of one of our buildings in uh, San Diego, uh, just installed uh, solar panels. We are looking for the best business cases, and all of these projects are, uh, I would describe 95% are third party financed. We have found that that partnership with the financial community and with the uh, energy savings uh, or energy savings performance contracts, utility. Uh, energy services contracts, power purchase agreements have been very, very good in allowing us to diversify our portfolio, portfolio and also to squeeze that more mission value out of every unit of, of electricity, whether it's a kilowatt or a barrel of, uh, barrel of fuel. I look forward to your questions. Thanks a lot. And the third of our trio, uh, Kathleen Hogan, uh, Deputy Assistant of the De uh, De Deputy Assistant Secretary for Energy Efficiency of the Department of Energy. Her title has not changed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, and it is great to be with all of you uh, here today. So, uh, as this uh, in this position, uh, what I really do is oversee the energy efficiency portfolio at the Department of Energy, which is actually a pretty broad uh, portfolio. It includes research, of course national appliance standards, federal energy management, which facilitates uh, federal lead by example on energy efficiency and renewable energy issues. Uh, we do a lot of work with partnerships with the private sector, states, local governments. Uh, we do low income weatherization, a very large program, um, and as other things. But when you step back and you really think about what is central to all of these efforts, of course, it is the compelling benefits of energy efficiency, right? It's the lower bills. It's the reduced air pollution, uh, and hand in hand with that, it's the lower, uh, it is the jobs that we get and the enhanced economic growth. Uh, it's hard to find something else that can work so hard for us, uh, you know, in, in terms of what it can do for this country. And we really have benefited a lot, as Jim showed you, uh, with his charts. Uh, another way of looking at the numbers that he put up is that we have. Uh, cut our energy intensity in half uh, since 1980. Uh, and so everything uh, that goes with that, with lower bills, reduced air pollution, uh, is really tremendous. But of course, what makes this happen, it's largely uh, technological innovation. Not all, but largely technological innovation. Uh, some great examples out there. Today's refrigerator. 
Uh, you know, it's, we all take it for granted, but if you compare it to uh, a 1980 refrigerator, it uses a quarter the energy, it's bigger, it has more features, and it costs half the price of a refrigerator in 1980. What a great technology story. And it's similar stories for air conditioners, clothes washers, other things in the home. And what's the transformation that is happening before our eyes? It's lighting with LEDs. They use 85% less energy than the Thomas Edison incandescent. They're very long lasting. You're not running to the store every six months. Uh, and what's uh, interesting with some of the new generation on the market is intriguing capabilities for color tuning. I can't wait to see what we're all going to do with that. But what is it that's uh, driven this innovation? Uh, it's driven by uh, a variety of policies, private sector uh, motivations, but also policies at the federal, state, and local level. Examples. Federal appliance standards, which have been in place um, since the late 80s, are uh, saving consumers $64 billion a year on their utility bills in 2015 alone. At the same time, create, creating a uh, national marketplace for these products to be sold instead of having a state-by-state -state approach. And these savings continue to grow. We have state and local-led building codes building energy savings in from the day one of, uh, of these structures, which are currently saving about $5 billion, again, with savings that are growing. We have a robust energy efficiency industry fielded by utilities uh, and other program administrators that are helping their customers save, or another way to look at it is, they're procuring energy savings at half the cost of bringing new energy supplies online. And that's all adding up to investing billions a year uh, in, in products, high efficiency products, uh, and also savings of billions of dollars a year. And sort of a newer approach that we're seeing out there is cities and communities that are using building energy transparency requirements and business challenges to motivate uh, improvements broadly across their downtowns uh, that are also starting to show some great results. So DOE, what are we doing? Um, you know, well, we're pursuing a whole variety of goals and strategies in partnership, of course, with uh, people across the country, including our national labs, that have co contributed to and will continue to catalyze a lot of this progress. We have a goal of doubling our nation's energy productivity, uh, that to get twice the economic value from every energy unit we use. So this means we're not only doing things to save energy and money, but we're actually trying to target a lot of our approaches to put the US in a leadership position on energy efficiency and clean energy solutions because there is such a uh, rapidly growing global marketplace for these things. So again, what does this mean we're doing in our homes and buildings, which currently do account for 40% of our energy use and about a $400 billion annual energy bill it means we're working on things like next generation technologies that can save 45% savings uh, in building energy over the high efficiency cost effective technologies that are already on the market today. We're demonstrating new whole buildings where you can put these technologies in and see and address the systems issues, demonstrating 50% uh, savings uh, over the buildings that are out there today. We're linking these building systems in ways that contribute to a robust electricity grid, much of that work being done not that far down the road at the National Renewable Energy Lab. We're working to integrate distributed generation with buildings uh, at the building, community, and regional levels. And we're fielding those through a bunch of initiatives called uh, Zero Energy Ready, uh, because it, that's really, I think, synonymous with start by being lean. Uh, be ready by having a low load and then be ready to come and put renewable energy and pair it up in the way that makes sense at the building community or regional level uh, and, and doing other things. On the manufacturing front, we have a flagship effort uh, that's been uh, a big undertaking the last few years. It's a new set of clean energy manufacturing institutes, part of a Manufacturing USA network to uh, improve our country's manufacturing competitiveness. 
So these institutes are supporting innovation and workforce development in advanced manufacturing materials and processes. Things like next generation semiconductors, otherwise known as using wide band gap materials, which can increase the efficiency uh, with which we use motors throughout manufacturing with potentially stunning implications. Increase the use of motorized compressors in important areas throughout industry. Improve the efficiency of our grid. Improve the capabilities of electric vehicles. And oh, really reduce the energy required to run data centers. So we're hoping we can take his energy use down even further. So uh, we're also working on advanced high strength and lightweight composite materials which can improve uh, vehicle efficiency, plane, train efficiency, enable renewable power, smart manufacturing, bringing uh, the benefits of data and information technologies to optimize manufacturing processes, offering tremendous savings throughout the supply chain, chemical process intensification to uh, improve the energy protect productivity of some of our most energy intensive processes and industries, and also looking for ways to just reduce the embedded energy in manufactured materials so we can avoid the many quads of energy that we're either um, you know, putting in our landfills or shipping um, across the seas. And we're also supporting advancements in additive manufacturing and 3D printing, which just opens up um, just whole new horizons for product designs and shortening time to market with rapid prototyping. And hopefully some of you have seen the uh, fully drivable 3D printed Shelby Cobra uh, that is uh, helping show what 3D printing uh, can really do. So these efforts really um, are tremendous, uh, engaging hundreds of firms of all sizes in new innovation ecosystems, uh, to providing access to new tools and facilities, and already making progress. At the same time, we are working with lots of partners across the country to just push on the savings that are there today. Uh, we've got a whole variety of uh, partners that are working with us, an initiative called Better Buildings, Better Plants, that are showcasing a whole array of solutions for how to reduce their energy use across whole portfolios of buildings by 20% or more, and then really showcasing the solutions that uh, that they use to uh, make it work, tackling some important problems and showing how to do it. And uh, we continue to work with our states uh, through our state energy program to uh, develop and share best practices. We continue to uh, field what's been a long-standing and successful program for helping some of the, uh, uh, the, the, low, you know, the least uh, advantaged uh, people through our low um, weatherization assistance program which now is uh, it's just had its 40th uh, anniversary, and it, we've now been able to help reduce the energy burden of uh, more than 7 million low-income families, and that'll keep going along. So the bottom line here from all of this, I think from the Department of Energy's perspective, uh, and I'll echo some of the earlier comments, is this is just a tremendously exciting time for energy efficiency. We are in the midst of really dramatic change uh, buildings, consumers, how we interact with our systems, uh, you know, is changing, a revolution in manufacturing, revolution in the technologies that we're living through, uh, it is just amazing. And, you know, what we see is we just need to keep uh, pushing forward on a, a full variety of strategies. Energy is basically in everything we do. We need to keep pursuing those opportunities. Uh, and we need to keep looking for the leaders that will keep uh, pushing uh, the envelope so we can keep working on the problems that remain there to, uh, to be pushed through. So again, great to be here, and uh, we look forward to answering your questions. You, any one of you can be the first to ask a question on here. <laughs> So um, high payoff because your question will probably be asked if you, if you text quickly. Um, what I hope you ended up seeing is that here we have a system in which we have been decarbonizing the economy, creating energy security, and creating profitability of our companies by a process which has been on the average over the last 
more than 40 years, reducing energy intensity by about 2% a year average. The last five years have been faster than the average of the earlier years. The last two years have been faster than the last five years. So the process is slightly accelerating. It's been actions by hundreds of millions of people in the, in, in the United States and hundreds of thousands of companies and organizations, all working individually in ways that have been beneficial to our nation. So we can only give you a slice of a couple of the ways in which it's happening in the military by getting you a more effective fighting force through energy efficiency, in corporations getting more competitive, uh, profitable corporations for individuals saving costs on their bills. But it's been one of those tremendous things that can, should be a totally nonpartisan issue, and so far it is. Jim, I'd, I'd like to just um, mention that uh, LEDs on Navy ships, uh, you'd think, okay, let's do it, energy efficiency, a uh, good thing, yes, but the secondary and tertiary benefits are incredible. First of all, LEDs, as you probably know, don't fail at nearly the rate that uh, other forms, including uh, fluorescent or compact fluorescents do. So the savings in sailor manpower aboard ship, and oh, by the way, the improvement in, in lighting is just great benefits direct. The other aspect of it, of course, is when you go to sea in the old days with uh, fluorescent bulbs, two foot uh, long fluorescent bulbs, you had storerooms full of spares because you knew they were gonna fail. So you had a choice between dark areas of the ship or you know, use the storerooms to bring it. Great savings. Oh, by the way, when you get back into port, you've got hazardous material in the form of the mercury in the old uh, fluorescence. So I use that point. You can start out by saying, I want to be more energy efficient on my ship by, re by relamping it with LEDs. But you get all of these very, very significant benefits as well. Let me um, um, pose the first question to Rob then. Um, you talked about the use of the data and infrastructure. Um, how does this change how people work in your organization? Well, I think there's, there's a couple of things. So the, the first thing is I think you want to have the most comfortable space you possibly can have. And so by uh, reducing errors in just the way the systems work, you're actually getting more productivity because people aren't uncomfortable, right? So that's one area. I think the other way uh, that we're seeing changes well beyond just the building is the most efficient thing to do is actually not have an office or go to your office, right? So when you think about the paradigm of energy efficiency at the extreme, it's can you get more and more people to work remotely, more and more people to work from home. I think the other piece is once you actually start to look at the use patterns, and we've done this within our buildings, you can reconfigure the building so you have more shared workspace, more dynamic workspace, and so you actually reduce the physical number of square feet you need per individual within the space itself. So those are just a couple of examples, which is I get to work from home so I don't have to commute, which also spews out a lot of energy and requires energy. Uh, I've got much more comfortable space when I'm in my workspace, and therefore I'm not actually being unproductive because it's too cold, too hot. And then, of course, the configuration and the dy dynamic space is also really interesting. I think the next wave that will happen is actually integrating not just, and I talked about integrating six different disparate building systems, and that's super interesting. But what if I can actually, and also looking at people movement throughout buildings, so that's sort of two separate things. How do you actually think about the fact that most of our calendars are stored in a database somewhere? Right? So now I can actually do predictive dynamic flow through so that my phone, sort of like I you know, was talking about before, why doesn't it tell me which building and which office to go to? You know, because it doesn't make sense when 20 to 30 percent of your workforce isn't there on any given day to heat or cool 100 percent of your space. Right. Let me ask you a related question, uh, Admiral McGinn. Um, there's a green, there's a green E on some of your ships, and there's a reason for that. Could you tell about the the way you motivate uh, the men and women of of the of of, of the um, the services to sure. energy efficiency? Sure, uh, very very uh, talented, dedicated, and competitive uh, force in the Navy and Marine Corps. All the services, so. Uh, uh, the uh, Secretary of the Navy awards energy awards for people and ships 
and units that get the job done for less energy. It's a very, very um, uh, straightforward proposition. The metrics are, are there and tracked by th up through the chain of command. Um, let me just comment on the color of the E. You hear about Great Green Fleet. We did that. Green Hornet. Uh, we flew uh, uh, an F-18 with 100% uh, biofuel. So a lot of folks, uh, because of our own enthusiasm in marketing what we're doing, thought this was all about uh, reduction of greenhouse gases. No, it's all about the mission. The reduction of greenhouse gases in some parts of the political sp spectrum are just an unfortunate consequence of uh, what we are doing to improve the mission. Right. Uh, Kathleen, uh, the, are you running out of opportunities for more energy efficiency improvement? Are they, is it sort of like a renewable resource that there's more and more opportunities keep coming up? Talk yeah. about that, please. Yeah, sure. I mean, that's certainly a great question. Um, you know, one of the big industries out there that I talked about is the utility industry, right? That's uh, delivering energy savings to their customers. Uh, and I think one of the big concerns was when uh, the LED lights come in uh, and you, that you're, you're, you know, so changing the, the, the program mix that they could deliver and you're taking away some of the savings opportunity as the market would transform itself. But you know what, they're going as strong as ever. Uh, with the other opportunities that are out there. There's so many things that remain untapped uh, that are still cost effective and that the utilities can leverage. And then of course there are new things coming along um, you know, basically you know, every day, every year. I mean there's just an, uh, there's a up and coming I think revolution with refrigeration. You know, I, I talked about the refrigerator and where it is. I didn't mention we have a project underway that's, for, that's cutting that energy use in half again. Uh, so again, the, 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 tr the low-hanging fruit on the tree uh, does keep coming back. Uh, Rob, you talked a lot about um, what you've done in Microsoft. Is this generalizable to many other companies? I mean, not all companies are Microsoft and as sophisticated as you are in information systems and so forth. Is this special to you or is it something that can be adopted across the board? It's absolutely something, you know, I, I, for us, we look at it, which is if we have a problem in a scenario which is not unique to us, and certainly building energy efficiency is not unique to Microsoft, how do we actually create an ecosystem of partners and services so that what we learn becomes democratized and cheap for everybody else? So if you look at what we did, you know, there are lots of other big enterprise companies. I always say, look, 15 million square feet is kind of interesting. You got to get to 15 billion square feet before we're actually going to have an impact. And so there are lots of other big companies, but one story which is great is there's a small municipality in the state of Massachusetts. They have like a 30,000 square foot building. That's their entire infrastructure. They deployed the same system we deployed on our corporate campus, and they saw a similar reduction in taxpayer cost of about 20%. On the energy bill, so it'll span the whole spectrum. It's just getting it democratized and commoditized and easily configurable. That's how we're going to accelerate success. Great, thank you, um, Dennis. Um, one of the things I find fascinating is the movements in some of your shore bases where you really brought down to the individual um, family the incentives on energy energy efficiency through targets and prices. Could you talk a little bit about that and tell people about whether this is effective or not? It, it really is. In fact, I think the and, most- And tell people what it is, because I was very cryptic. Well, uh, on our, uh, our uh, naval installations, Navy and Marine Corps bases around the, uh, around the world, um, we place a great premium on maintaining high quality of life. But we know that through the combination of partnerships with our, our housing contractors, through technology insertion, rooftop solar, uh, programmable thermostats, uh, better HVAC and, and water heating systems, better refrigerators, uh, that uh, it really, really is key. But we have also found that the most powerful factor is culture. Under, getting people to understand how directly relatable their energy use is to their quality of life, or in the case of, uh, of uh, the mission, to uh, what they do in the field. The, uh, 
the Marine Corps about a year ago came out with the energy ethic for all Marines. And it, the idea was when you're in garrison, in barracks, on the base, uh, your awareness of how much energy you are using directly translates to your thought process, your, your ethic when you're out there in the field or actually in combat. So this is a, a powerful cultural dynamic that is in, in happening in, uh, in both our Navy and Marine Corps. Great, thank you. All good things must end, and this must end. We're out of time, so thank you all three. <laughs>